Hello, this is Gordon Goodwin. Thank you for joining us today as we take an inside look at the Big Fat Band's new release, That's How We Roll. In this series of videos, we'll go deep inside the recording and production process that we undergo while making a record of this kind. Making a record like this doesn't happen overnight. It takes organization, planning, passion, perseverance, sweat equity, and money. Mustn't forget about the money. So, come with me if you dare as we speak in intimate detail with key members of the Big Fat Band and we'll see firsthand the kind of evil genius it takes to make a modern day big band record. Welcome to the making of That's How We Roll. Okay, everybody, it's not very often that I get to be in such close proximity with two oh, <laughs> handsome gentlemen. A little, a little too close. For a little bit too close. All right, so can I get comfortable here? Well, for me, it's a you know, it's not happen that often. It's a it's a rare treat for me to sit this close. I mean, you guys seem to be you know at least 10, 12 feet away from me when we do a gig. Right. I don't get to feel the the electricity that comes from being Andy Martin or Wayne Bergeron. It's almost far enough away. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you that uh, oh, haven't Wayne. lived under a rock and don't know. Wayne Bergeron is a lead trumpet player with the Big Fat Band, and Andy Martin is our first trombonist. Uh, both charter members of the band, right? That's right. Yeah. And you're still showing up for gigs most of the time. We show up all the time. What do you mean? I have no idea. What, mm. We're not selling out. What do you, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, okay, for instance, you know, I know the Big Fat Band is not your only activity. What, like today, what did you do you know, for today? Dancing with the That's stars. That's great. Okay, how about you? <laughs> I did. Uh, anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> you know, you're gonna have to get, I'm going to have to start taking outside work. Like, <clears> yeah. Sure, I'm, band. I yeah. need to do it, but I'm going to have to start doing that. If you do that, though, you might risk missing out on opportunities like being a, on the record like this. That's how we roll. Uh -huh. You know, I'm not sure how you... You're not going to use me? If you, had to, if you had to choose between playing Dancing on the Stars and doing this record, I mean, what would you do? Musically, that record every time. Ah, boy! Let me ask you this. Is the skill set that you needed to play on this music? Do you, how close do you get that uh, on a typical Dance with the Stars uh, taping? Uh, never. <laughs> 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 you know, it's probably be a good idea not to completely sink your commercial career here <laughs> during this video. <laughs> no, believe me, Dance with the Stars is a great gig. Pays the bills. I love it, and yeah. lots of cute girls dancing around with very little clothing. So that part, you gotta like work I on said, it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you gotta work on that part yeah. of it. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah, I'm with him on that. Like, right. Dancing girls. Thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's get around to the music on this record, and and of course, uh, having pe people who talk to me about the difficulty of my arrangements, all I have to do is point to these guys, and if you had them in your band, what would you write? Because the truth is, everything I write, they play, and we're going to talk about some of the charts that they contributed to in a significant way, starting with. Uh, a tune that I wrote to be as hard as possible. I mean, it, I really tried to make it hard. It's called Race to the Bridge. And it features solis on each section. This leading off with a fairly difficult trombone soli. Now, but tell me for sure, it, is this something that is like a, at a difficulty level 1 to 10? Who would you rate that soli? Oh, I would say a 9 plus, maybe. Really? Yeah. Really? So you think that... Like, the, how you play it now, I mean, is it that much better than how you played it, uh, you know, the first time we read it? Was it really... I think it's better now because we figured out how to play it better. I think over the period of playing it a number of times, you kind of get a feel for it, and you know what's coming, and you know what to lay for, and mm -hmm. using certain slide positions to make it easier. Stuff like that's come mm -hmm. along, yeah. Right. You know, it's got a high D-flat at the end of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we did publish that arrangement, and I, I revoiced the chord to, for like an optional, you know, lower partial oh, yeah. in case, you know. Oh, that wouldn't be voicing, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know how many high school players, trumpet yeah. players have a high D flat. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. That's, yeah. up, that's up yeah. there, yeah. Yeah, so uh, after the trombone solely, uh, there's an equally different, maybe even more difficult trumpet solely. It's pretty difficult. I, I would give it an eight, probably. Really? It sounds yeah. more difficult. Oh. <laughs> At least you guys make it, I'm just teasing. Yeah. Just teasing. Uh, okay. I would give it an 8 because, you know, we, we do some other things that are pretty difficult as well. So yeah. I don't want to put anything at a 10 because I know you can write harder than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're right. That, you know. Don't push me, man. <laughs> maybe I should have said it was a 10, so you won't. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was surprised you wouldn't call it an 8 because I really tried to, to make it one of those things that's a high wire act, yeah. you know, so that people in the audience, and I think they do react that way. They're like, well, oh, yeah, you know, all those guys are playing. But it's not easy, but it, it you know, it's effective. So. Now, if you, if you step away from it for a while, 
and then you have to play it again. I mean, does it take you a minute to find it again on the? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. There's yeah. a couple yeah. licks in there. I gotta look at that again. Uh -huh. Definitely. Wow. Well, uh, the song's based on "I Got Rhythm Changes," which is, of course, the mother load, you know, for jazz players, and we we all love love playing on those chords, and and uh, yields a multitude of possibilities, improvisationally and also compositionally, yeah. you know. Um, so, all right. Well, uh, let's segue to uh, another song that we did on the record, <coughs> which is uh, an arrangement of a American classic. Actually, I, I would, I'd even broaden it out to be, you know, not just an he was an American composer, but we've played this composition all over the world, you know, and audiences just respond to it like nothing else. And we're talking about George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. Um, both Wayne and Andy feature prominently in, in, the, in the arrangement. And it was an arrangement that, by and large, I just didn't want to mess it up, you know, because it's so iconic. And everybody knows, like, what it's supposed to sound like, right? So, yeah. I mean, do you, when you play this, do you uh, relate it in any way to, you know, the orchestral version, uh, you know, that we all know so well? Or does it, is it, you know, kind of big fat band-esque centric? No, I mean, I think the, especially the, ba the ballad section where Andy has a solo and then I follow, mm -hmm. is definitely more on the orchestral side of things. And uh, I don't think you've taken <clears throat> too much liberty with what he put down there. I mean, you mm -hmm. have some swing sections and things, but... Yeah, but even the swing sections, I don't know if you guys even notice, uh, there's <coughs> transition material that you can find elsewhere in the original score. Yeah, now I hear, you know yeah. the score very well, apparently. Yeah, because well, <laughs> I, went, I went through the score and said, okay, I really need this theme, and I need this theme, and I knew I only had five minutes to, uh, to write, to have this arrangement it would be. So I, so I would take other themes and just kind of, you know, jam them in as transitions mm -hmm. or, or whatever. But, um, so... Your soul, and we've talked a little bit about this I've in terms got, of yeah. how, talk about you <laughs> how you Your interpret. Soul. Enough it. about me. What do you think about me? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Andy has the, uh, the 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 real lyrical ballad theme in this in this uh, piece, and um, the uh, stylistic point of view you take is not Tommy Dorsey, is it? No, I'm definitely not. And I I felt that it seems like an orche orchestral moment at that time, and I thought, well. You know how would an orchestral player play that? And he'll play it pretty straight, I would think. You know, and, and in terms of vibrato, vibrato. Yes, I'm talking about vibrato. And I'm, I play smooth. I take chances without. I'm not putting a tongue attack on any of the notes. I'm playing it pretty straight, just air uh -huh. and hitting the notes with my chops, uh -huh. and um, which is hard to do actually. And the less vibrato you put on it with a slide, it makes it even tougher for the pitch. Yeah, because you have to right. nail the pitch. You have to nail the intonation. You've got to nail the intervals, uh -huh. um, and you can't. You cover anything up with vibrato. So you're way. showing off, basically. Is what you're basically, saying. that's what okay. I'm trying to tell you. you know what I'm talking about here. Pulling focus from my chart. Pulling focus yeah. from Gershwin. I mean, uh, just showing off. That's all no, but I'm just saying. I th I thought the piece. I thought it would sound a little corny to put slide vibrato on it. To tell you the truth, and I don't know. I don't know. If you want me to put slide vibrato on it. I'd be more than happy to. <laughs> well, it's a late now. <laughs> well, it's it's become kind of a bit for us in the band that we tease him that he doesn't do it. I, I seriously, I'm not ready to ask you to do that because it's, it should be you. It should be your you know interpretation of it. I, I confess that my ears were used to hearing more of a you know Dorsey ass Dick Nash kind of thing on it. Um, but I think what you do is completely lovely, you know, and and um, and, and he's right. I think it is. Harder, you know, you can cover a multitude of sins with your stylistic inflections and vibrato and things like that. It also, but you know, to, in my opinion, uh, if you don't mind me, <laughs> a slide vibrato on the trombone does date things. You know, tr trombonists seem to get away with it more though on on old on ballad type things. They use a lot of vibrato. If a trumpet player went to that era, it would sound corny. Like if I went to Harry James, uh -huh. for instance, I'm, I'm, when I take the solo, now I did put a little vibrato on it just to take it because I took the ball from Andy. Okay, now I add a little bit. Well, but plus it modulates. Yeah, you yeah. Know, and kind of gets raises intensity. Uh, but without theory. making it, but if he did it, if, if he did it like Tommy Dorsey, then I did it like Harry James. Is there, a trumpet, was, is there a trumpet player that you kind of model your approach after for a solo uh, like that? There's a lot of guys. Um, but I, I think of maybe guys that I work with in town here, like Warren Lonin, uses a slower vibrato. Uh, Little, it still sings, but it's a. Uh, it doesn't date things so much. Mm -hmm. A little hipper, you know. I mean, I think the trumpet thing needs to be worn with a little. Like, bit. Thinking about other soloists, you know, like what Maynard would do. He'd be vibrating. Like he'd be crazy, all. Right? He'd be all over it. <laughs> Doc Severin. So what would Doc do? Well, Doc would schmaltz it up. It'd be more Mary James. James, James. Yeah, yeah, James. And it would sound great. I mean, it's not. It wouldn't. It wouldn't sound bad to do that. But I does. I do think it. It dates it. It would yeah. date it. You can listen to Wayne's solo, and he does have a. Especially when he sustains a note. There's just kind of a. 
a pulse to it, a movement to the note as he holds it. And uh, I think that actually gives a, it helps sustain the note and propel the note through the end of the yeah, phrase. Yeah, I mean, that's what I think about it, trying to make it resonate more than use vibrato. Uh -huh. you know? uh, how did you work out the breathing on that? Because I know it's a pretty windy solo <laughs> and, and uh, finding places to tank up to get to the end. Well, the first few times I did it, I didn't know where to breathe and I didn't want to take breaths because there's things like, well, I'd love to sustain this through. But I found a couple of places where I could sink a quick breath and then I wanted the big payoff where it goes to the to the F, uh -huh. I didn't want to breathe there. And that's the obvious place to breathe. So I tanked up before that and backed off on the section before, mm -hmm. volume-wise, and then did a crescendo. But let's not forget what was happening with Wayno right around the time we started playing that chart. That's right. He had a little injury. Right? Yeah, I had a lip injury. And you were coming back from that and having to play arguably one of the more difficult moments you have to play on, on, the, on the gig. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Is there a... Is there a kind of a mind over matter thing, you guys, when, you have, when you're dealing with maybe some kind of phys physical problem and it's time to play some music and you, you, you step up and you play it or you don't? Is there some sort of a, uh, you know, a mindset that you get into to do that? Oh, the only thing I can think of is just you just have to th start thinking about your airstream. Make the totally air work right. for you. Make the air support work for you. Uh -huh. And don't get, psych yourself out as far as that goes. But I know there's been times where I've played so, the trombone so much where I can barely get a sound out. I can't play anything soft or something like that, so that really freaks me out. When that comes, I know Wayne knows a lot more about chops than I do because he's been through much different t types of problems, but I feel that you have to get a hot shower or something like that, loosen things up, make sure you're hydrated, make sure you're rested, and I think everything comes so together. So it's, it's not a function of, of rest support, it's just, it's just the uh, interface. Both. I think here. it's both, yeah. It is. Yeah, I think it's both. Yeah, yeah the breath, the breath sort, I mean, when I get into trouble, when I'm tired, and I'm on the gig, I'm going, okay, we've got three tunes to do. i still got to throw down here, and my chops are tired, I'm beat up, I'm swollen, you know, my lip hurts a little bit. Also a good left hand to pass the chart to the next guy. That's, <laughs> that's a great, great <laughs> trade of a great lead trumpet player. It's like, hey, you want to play this one? You know? But uh, I definitely think about my air, and I think about relaxing my upper body and just going to the fundamentals that I yeah. teach in my master classes and stuff, and I try to practice what I preach, and I, and I find that that gets me through the gig, mm -hmm. and a lot of times I'll get through the gig, and uh, even my colleagues go, man, how did you do that? You were on the ropes. Uh, I, I remember, do you remember when he came back from, um, it was a J Japan trip or something. Yeah, we were and, in Canada, and right? We were can you, yeah. you met us in Canada, and you were just toast. I mean, you were completely, completely I, I played trashed. 17 days in a row of like the hardest music ever written. <laughs> right, and then we did one night, and I remember we were doing Horn of Puente, and Wayne got through it, but it wasn't vintage Wayne. And then the next night, I took a little bit of a calculated risk because I really played it up on his introduction. I mean, I laid it on, <laughs> you know, and built it up. And Wayne stepped up there and just flipped the switch, you know. Just, it was, it was old time Wayne. I just, it was really remarkable to see that happen. Do you remember that night? Yeah, I do. I remember. I, I just kind of needed it a day because that first night back, I literally, you remember, I was late. <laughs> My airplane was late. I yeah. sat on the runway. I got in. I missed our first gig. Right. Right. That's right, that's right. And then when, when I got there, I mean, my chops were, I was jet lagged, uh, time change, and chop problems. I mean, I just, I had no physical strength, and that was the kind of the problem that night. The next, I had a night's rest. So know. what you're saying is, it wasn't my words of inspiration to you. It was just, you got another <laughs> well, day, no, no, and there it is. It had nothing to do with my leadership or, you know, the example I set. <laughs> you know, I know it's your band, but it's not always about you. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> No, but no, it did. I mean, I, when you when I hear that, I'm going, okay, I got to throw down too. So the <laughs> adrenaline kicks in, and uh -huh. that all helps as well. But you know, you if you can have all the adrenaline you want if your chops are not responding. You know, you're going to fall flat on your face. It's oh, like punching yes. a car with no gas in it. You know, it's not going to go. Yeah. So uh, and also, you know, I don't want to suck. <laughs> it's kind of like a motto. Despite you know, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> but it's kind of a motto of mine to go out there going, okay, I'm not going to suck tonight. <laughs> so, Fear is a good motivator. Yeah. yeah, isn't it though? Well, you know, lest we take up all of our time with a whiny brass playing my chops <laughs> turn talk, Ow. let's go to one of the songs on the record that has completely surprised me in terms of, of its appeal to people. And frankly, it wasn't going to make the cut on this record. Oh, please. <laughs> I'm no hey, you got to admit, that was pretty awesome. And there's more to come, so check back soon for more episodes of The Making of That's How We Roll. Yeah.